Leviticus chapter number 2 and verse number 13. Are you there? Say amen. amen. And the Bible says, And every oblation of thy grain offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy grain offering. And with all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning for allowing us to be here and, and the, uh, just the service in general. It's just always good to have old-fashioned Sunday. And, and I just pray, God, that you would help us for the next little bit as we try to get something from your word. And, Lord, we'll thank you for all that you do for us now. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. In that one verse, it talks about a salt covenant where you season things with salt. I told my doctor this verse, and he said he didn't believe it. And uh, he said, you got to lay off the salt. I said, well, the Bible says you put salt on everything. Thy meat offering, thy grain offering, you put salt on it. I believe in putting salt on things because the Bible says put salt on it. <laughs> and so here in this one verse, it talks about a covenant of salt. What is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement between two parties in the Bible. If somebody wanted to sign a covenant or an agreement or buy a piece of property or uh, buy an animal or whatever it was, they would have a covenant of salt that would put them into a binding agreement. Uh, you might be rem uh, uh, familiar with a marriage covenant. It's when two parties come together in the, in, in the eyes of God and they come together and have an agreement between two parties. God always had a covenant with mankind. Matter of fact, he had a covenant with Noah. Matter of fact, he said, Noah, I will not flood this earth with water ever again. Matter of fact, I'm going to put a token of this covenant in the sky. It's a rainbow in the sky and that will be almost like God reaching down and shaking hands with man and says, I will keep my end of the deal. God has always kept his end of the deal. God has a covenant. He has a, an agreement with mankind. The Noahic covenant. He had an agreement with Abraham. And Abraham in the plains of memory, he had a covenant, an agreement with Abraham. The Davidic covenant. All through the Bible, there are uh, covenants that God made with man. King David had an agreement all through the Bible. And God has a covenant with the nation of Israel. And let me say this. God says, they are my chosen people. Keep your hand off of them. And America would do real good to keep supporting them and fighting for them. <laughs> Hallelujah. I could get real political right here, but I don't want them to take me off the YouTube and the Facebook and really don't care anyway. What we need to do is go over there. Everybody that's bombing the nation of Israel, go over there and make a parking lot out of the place. Now, you may not like that, but you're at the right place here this morning. You said, I wouldn't say that. That's why God called me, wouldn't call you, because you, I'd say it and you wouldn't. The covenant between mankind. Then there's a covenant that you might be, and I hope and pray that you are familiar with, and it's called the blood covenant where God has an agreement with mankind when sin entered into the garden, God devised a plan. It's called the plan of redemption, the plan of salvation, where God, in other words, makes agreement with mankind. And you say, how do you enter into this blood covenant? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how you get into the blood covenant. God has always required blood. If you ever thought about in the book of Genesis, when mankind sinned, God came down. Man tried to cover their own selves with the fig leaves and all of that kind of stuff. You know the story. But God says, that won't work. I require blood to get into this covenant. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. It's always been by the blood, always will be by the blood. It was by the blood in Eden, it's by the blood in Egypt, and it'll always be by the blood in eternity. God says, I'll kill this animal and I will clothe you because blood had to be shed. 
You go to the next chapter in chapter number four, there's two twin boys that are born Cain and Abel. You know the story. And Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. He brought, going to do a sacrifice. He brought his little altar. He brought his turnips uh, and his uh, green, uh, his um, anything that was green. He brought it. It was a salad and he made tomatoes and he brought all of this stuff and he put it in his all the works of his own hands. And God looked at that offering and said, listen, Cain, I don't even like salads. It's in the Bible. Well, I got to have a salad. The doctor said, you don't, listen, God don't even like salads. God requires blood. And so he looked at Cain's offer and he said, I don't like that. I cannot accept it. And then Abel over here brought of the firstling of his flock. He killed that animal. Blood was dripping off of that altar. And God says that right there satisfies the courtroom of heaven because it's redemption by the blood. You go to the book, uh, book of Genesis there in chapter number 12 and you look and now the, the, the children of Israel are in bondage in the land of Egypt and God says, I'm coming through the land and I'll tell you what I want you to do. Take a lamb of the first year. Take it away on the 10th day and on the 14th day, I want you to kill it and put the blood on the top post and on the two side posts, the top post and the two side posts, the top post and the two side posts on the door. You say, why did he put it on the window? They could have put it on the window, but it wouldn't work. They could have put it on the roof, it wouldn't have worked. They could have put it on the shingles, but it wouldn't have worked. You got to put it on the door because 2,000 years later, there was a Jesus Christ coming down the road that says, I am the door, and if any man come in, I will sup with him and he with me. And so they put the blood on the doorpost and when God come through the land, he said, if I see the blood, I will pass over you. I'm glad, ladies and gentlemen, as a 10-year-old boy, I got the blood applied to the doorpost of my heart and when I get to heaven, I ain't going because I'm good. I'm going because he's good. Hallelujah. It's called the blood covenant. I remember, I remember when uh, uh, Dalton, my firstborn, Remember when he was born? I ain't gonna tell you all of it because I'd be embarrassed. But I, I was in, I made the mistake. I got three kids. I went in on the first one. I didn't go in no more. That's the awfulest thing I ever seen in my life. I went on there. The doctor got mad at me just because I got a little queasy and fell out in the floor. They said, would you get him out of here? I can't even concentrate right here because I'm fooling with him. <laughs> they got me stood back up. Here come Dawson. And, and, and this is what, Tommy, this was, they pulled out this long cord. <laughs> handed me a pair of scissors and said, cut right here. I said, I ain't doing it. <laughs> Whoever come up with that tradition is a sick individual. I said, I ain't cutting it. You cut it. We're paying you. <laughs> and they cut that cord. Here come, here come some nurses in with a cart. And they started taking blood out of that umbilical cord. And, and, and I was like, okay, what, 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 what's going on right here? And why, why are we doing this? And they said, well, we're taking this blood. It's called the blood cord registry. And we take this blood. And that's a long time ago now. I don't know what to do now. But this a long time ago. And they would take this blood out of the umbilical cord. I said, why are you doing that? He said, well, we charge you a little extra. I said, I figured that. We charge you a little extra. And when your kid is born, we take that blood. When it's, it's its purest form is in that cord. And we take that blood out. And we'll take several vials of that blood out of there and we'll freeze it in a freezer somewhere. I said, well, what are we doing that for? And they said, well, the reason we do that is because we have found that if this child later on in life gets an infection or gets real bad sick, a sickness that's in the blood, we can go back to the original blood. <laughs> Where, where's my Pentecostal side at? We can go unfreeze this original blood and inject it back into this child. It will overtake the infected blood and run the infection out. I said, whoa, doctor, that already happened to me. 
I said, when man entered the garden, he had a perfect environment, perfect blood, and when sin entered into the world, he infected that blood flow in his body. Him and Adam and Eve, it was infected. So God says, let's go back to the original blood. I'm going to send the last Adam to come to this world to die for the sin. The original blood, you see, that's where, he, that's where it come from. You said, is that in the Bible? Yes. I did my homework before I come. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God says, let me go back to that original blood. And there is a fountain filled with blood. And so as a 10-year-old boy, hey, they injected the original blood into my infected blood. It run out the infection. I had a blood transfusion and now I'm going to heaven not because of my blood because it is infected but I'm going to heaven because I got his blood in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. That is called the blood covenant. And so I tell you, I remember, you know, when you wash clothes, it's war, you got an R in it, wash clothes. I'm trying to teach y'all something. I know there's not an R in there, but it's supposed to be. When we sang the song, we proved it the other Sunday, are you washed in the blood? It's got an R in it. Nobody says, are you washed in the blood? Unless you're from Chicago or something. <laughs> if you ever get a stain in your clothes, if you ever get a stain in your clothes, you get you some of that, uh, and I, I, I designed it. It's called Mr. Clean. I designed it. <laughs> and you put you some Mr. Clean on it or the, what they call it, shout. And you, whatever, you shout it out, and you put it on, and it's what they said. I looked it up, I said, this is what it says. It says that that shout gets in between the fabric and the, and the stain and lifts the stain off the, gets in between. The, let me get right over here. It, it gets in between the fabric and the stain and lifts... I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. Love lifted me. Got between the stain and the fabric, and he'll lift that stain off of the fabric, and it washes down the drain, and you can... Mm, Mark, Mark, guess what? When that stain goes down the drain, you can't get the stain out of the drain and put it back on the fabric after it's been washed. I'm enjoying my own preaching. And when the stain of sin, the blood got between, got between me and the stain and lifted that sin off of me, got in between me and lifted it off and now I'm clean by the blood. That's called the blood covenant. I spend more time on that than I probably should have, but that's, I'm preaching to the choir because you should know about the blood covenant. But what our scripture says, was that after that, there is a salt covenant. Now, let me tell you about this. The blood covenant, watch this. Pay attention right here. The blood covenant, God does everything. You don't have to do anything but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be. He does everything for you. You don't have to do nothing but believe. That's all you got. You got to do nothing. Jesus paid it all. The salt covenant is a little different. The blood covenant, he does everything for you, but the salt covenant requires you to do something. Mm. Now, y'all were shouting while I go. 
Now, now the salt covenant, now when they, when they got ready to, to uh, make an agreement in the Old Testament, whether it was Abraham, whether it was David, whatever it was, two parties would get together. One would bring a loaf of bread and they would bring it to the table. The other person would bring salt and that person would crumble up that bread on the table. They would crumble up that bread on the table and then the other person would salt that bread. Once that was salted and they would crumble that thing up, there was no way to separate the salt and the bread after it's done got together. It's a covenant. You can't undo it after it's been done. And so the bread and then the salt and then you mix it all together, you can't then pick out, oh, there's a piece of salt. It's all mixed in. It's a covenant. It can't be broken. And I got to thinking the salt covenant. Now, I think the Bible says something like this. I think it says something like this in John 6. I don't have it up there. But in John 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So, which means, all right, if you're saved in this room right now, Jesus Christ, come to church with you. So the bread is here. The bread is here. But now the salt covenant you say, well, who, who, who's supposed to bring the salt? All right. I think Matthew 5 says something like this. But ye are the salt of the earth. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, look here. God brings the bread and he crumbles it up around on his table and he says here on Old Fashioned Sunday, hey, what'd y'all bring to the table today? Oh, we're not talking about the fellowship meal. Yeah, a bunch of you brought, thank the Lord for it. We're fixing to partake of that in a minute. We're not talking about that. We're talking about in here. What did you bring to the service? Jesus did his part. He brought the bread. What did you bring? You were supposed to bring salt and sprinkle it on that bread. God says, I tell you what. I tell you what, I'll put my hand out, you shake hands with me, and I will bring revival to this land if you'll do your part. Salvation, salvation, I did everything for you. But now listen, I, I can't do everything for you because I didn't save you just to sit there and soak and sour. I did everything for you at salvation, but now listen, you say, Brother Jeremy, is that in the Bible? Yes, it's in the Bible. Do you remember Jesus parted the water and then Moses and them walked across on dry ground, the Red Sea? God parted it, molded it. They didn't do nothing, just walk across. Did you know 40 years later, they come to the Jordan? They got a new pastor named Joshua. And God says, mm, now I'm not going to park this one unless y'all get your feet wet first. I parted the Red Sea for y'all and you ain't do nothing. This one, somebody going to get your feet wet. I ain't doing everything for you. I'm taking you to heaven. Why don't you try to do something now that you're saved? Mm, Tommy, is that good preaching? What time is it, Tommy? I right, thank you. Now listen, Mark and Jerry, they, we, now we used to do that all the time. Uh, Keith and Charlie and them have gospel groups and Leslie, they've all had gospel groups and we get up there, y'all saw us a while ago we pick at one another, it's some of that, just some of that is entertain. we're trying to keep people's attention, make you laugh a little bit and all that kind of stuff and there's nothing wrong with that in it's proper place nothing wrong with that in it's proper, proper place but there is a difference in some singing some of the good sing-along songs, the streets of gold and the fast, you know, you and me, Jesus, and all that kind of stuff, and all of that, and wonderful, keeps your attention, everybody laughs, and, but then we bring it on down, and Mark sings, I owe it all to him, and we're hoping some salt comes in the room then. There's a difference. You know, there's a difference when the salt comes in the room. I'll give an example. I remember going to uh, McKenzie, Tennessee. Uh, and been to McKenzie, Tennessee, Grace Baptist Church over there. Went over there, and that's when I was pastor in that wood, and they said I was going to be preaching during the Bible conference or whatever, and so I was there, and I come in. I didn't know these people. I was just invited to come. I didn't know many. I knew the pastor. I didn't know many people at all, and they, and they said, well, before Brother Jeremy comes, we got these three ladies that are going to come, and they're going to sing, sing a song, and I said, okay. Mate, I, don't, I didn't see a bus in the parking lot. I come in, I didn't see any CDs in the foyer. I said, can they sing? 
If you ain't got a bus, you ain't got CDs, I wonder can they sing. Now look, don't look at me like that. Y'all do the same thing. These ladies come up there. They, were, they wasn't dressed like singers. It was a mama and two daughters from Alabama. Lower parts of Alabama. They had a little Alabama draw to them. And I'm back there going, man, I'm fixing to have to preach after this. Don't judge me just yet. Hang on. They wouldn't get on the stage. They didn't want a microphone. I'm saying, what kind of singers we got here? <laughs> Mom and two daughters. They come right down here in front of the community table. No mics, no nothing. No accompaniment, no piano, no nothing. Mama steps out like this and says, There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. Had that little Alabama drum. No, not one. Naught else could feel all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Three part harmony, two dollars joined us. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. You know what happened? While, while, while they were singing that, people started coming to the altar. There was people doing this. We wasn't supposed to be at the altar. It wasn't the bulletin said it wasn't invitation time. You're not supposed to come to the altar until it's probably just as I am. And they was coming. And and the whole room filled up with salt. And I'm back there going, I don't want to preach after this. I don't want to preach after this. There's a difference when the salt comes into the room. I've heard preachers, some good ones. I've, heard, I've preached with some of the best. You said, how you know? They told me they was. <laughs> and they get up, boy, they, I mean, they got everything alliterated. And there's nothing wrong. I'm not talking about style. I'm not talking about nobody. I do it one way. They do it another. And as long as the words preach, they get it done. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord for it. That's fine. And boy, some of them, they get up there and boy, they just go through the little outline and boom, boom, boom. And, you know, and when they get done, everybody's like, oh, that was good. And, and all of that. And then they'll, they, they get some 83-year-old 80, 80, man. To get up there. He didn't make it past the fourth grade. Can't barely read. But he gets behind the pulpit and opens a Bible. And all he's got to do is say God. And salt comes in the room. You know what I'm talking about. There is a difference when salt comes, we've had service. Every service is not the same. Every, every, every service, we're not swinging off the fans and the chandeliers and all of that. Some services are real quiet and the salt comes in the room. Matter of fact, was it last Sunday? Man, we was up there, what was it? So we were singing a song. Leslie and them was singing a song. Jared and them, they were singing When I Lay My Isaac Down. And people start coming, down. it wasn't time to come to the altar. People start coming to the altar. Now, I'm y'all know my humor by now. They start coming to the altar in the middle of service. Why? Because salt just come in the room. There's a difference. God says, hey, I came today to Old Fashioned Sunday, and I brought the bread. I did my part. Who's going to bring the salt? Salt, you put salt on stuff to make it taste better. Salt makes stuff taste better. 
You say, church is boring. You probably need a salty church. I don't like church I go to. You might want to find one that's got a little salt on it. I just don't like that kind of thing. Find one that's got a little salt on it. There's a difference. I'll tell you another thing. Salt will irritate sometime when the preacher's preaching and the salt goes out there and you got a little cut or a wound. Mm. And the preacher's preaching real good and all of a sudden I can tell it. I can tell who's got cuts and who don't. I'm out there preaching and you're going, mm. 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 I can tell when you got a cut on you. That salt gets in that wound, you're like, mmm, mmm. But after, after you put that salt on that wound, then it starts to heal. Sam, have I got time to tell one more story? Sam P. Jones. Sam P. Jones, old circuit riding preacher. Old Methodist certain circuit riding preacher. That's back then. He didn't have a church. He'd just get on horseback and he'd go to different towns and he'd go and boy, he would preach. They'd set up a big old tent and people would get saved. And I'm talking about shut the whole town down. They rolled up the streets so everybody could go hear Sam P. Jones in the in the middle of nowhere and big old tent and boy, here they come. Boy, they come in by the droves. Man, he would be preaching. God told Sam Jones said. Sam Jones, I want you to go to Nashville, Tennessee. Take the tent, and I want you to set up. And I want you to preach. They said, okay. It wasn't about a day or two later, Sam Jones gets a telegram for, from a, a guy named Thomas Ryman. And Thomas Ryman was the biggest liquor industry owner in Nashville, Tennessee. He owned everything, gambling and anything of that type. Thomas Ryman was the guy that owned it all and controlled it all. He heard that Sam Jones was coming to town. He sent a telegram. He said, you tell that preacher, if he comes to Nashville, I'll kill him. He's not going to mess up my business. He's not bringing the Jesus train into my town and shutting my town down. Sam Jones got the telegram he read about a man who wanted to kill him. It's a day or two later, and God says, I thought I told you I want you to go to Nashville. Sam Jones says, hast thou not heard? <laughs> There's a guy going to kill me if I go. He said, you need to go, like I told you. If you'll go, I'll bring the bread, you bring the salt. Sam Jones loaded up. The big tent, here they go, Nashville, Tennessee. Got off the train. Asked the little man that's, that's uh, uh, you know, taking tickets at the end when you get off. It says, hey, excuse me, sir. Where does Mr. Thomas Ryman live? He said, the, you, the Thomas Ryman? Yes, the Thomas Ryman. He said, you see that big old mansion right on top of that hill right over there? That's where he lives. Everybody knows that. He said, can you get me somebody to take me up there? They put him in a horse and buggy and they took him up to Thomas Ryman's house. He, he Big old mansion. Butler came to the door. He said, can I help you? He said, yeah, I'm doing, I'm, I'm Sam P. Jones and I'm doing a revival here. I'm going to set up my tent and I'm going to do a revival here and God told me that I'm supposed to stay here while I'm doing the revival. Well, the butler thought maybe he didn't, you know, Mr. Ryman didn't tell him who was coming to visit that day. So he said, well, come on in. I'll show you up to your room. Took him upstairs. Second door on the right. Took him upstairs. He told him, stay right there. He said, this will be your room. Sam Jones says, let me know what time supper is. He said, about supper will be about, about five. And Mr. Ryman will be at the head table and come on down and, and he'll probably be expecting you. About five o'clock, right before tent revival start going to be starting. Sam Jones, big family Bible, top hat, overcoat, comes down the steps, sits down at the table. But before he sits down, he walks over to Mr. Ryman, sticks out his hand, he says, I'm Sam Jones. I heard you's going to kill me. But God told me I'm supposed to stay at your house while I'm doing this revival. Mr. Ryman got shaken mad. 
at salt irritates. Mr. Sam Jones sat down at the other end of the table. They had supper. Thomas Ryman wouldn't say a word. Finally, he had all he could stand. He looked at that preacher. He said, Preacher, you done ate one of my meals. You done took one of my rooms. When you get done your little revival tonight, you get out of here or I'm going to fulfill my promise. Sam Jones took off, went preaching. A bunch of people came down got saved. Matter of fact, several of the bartenders and the, and the waitresses and stuff that worked for Thomas Ryman in the liquor, they got saved. Sam Jones comes back after service. He goes back up to his little room. He opens his door and there's a note under the door for Mr. Ryman says, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but you can stay here as long as you're preaching and you come down and eat our food. Just don't say nothing to me and leave me alone. Salt makes you thirsty. Every night, Thomas Ryman, or uh, Sam Jones come eat at the table. Mr. Ryman wouldn't say nothing to him. Just sit there and eat his food. And while he was eating, Sam Jones would repeat what he was preaching the night before. And he said, oh, by the way, so-and-so won't be at work tonight. She got saved last night. That revival went on for about two weeks. That big tent. Me and hard, him old hard uh, uh, wood chairs that they had, a big old tent, and all them people packed up in there like sardines, listening to preaching. But last night, Thomas Ryman walks into the back of the tent. Sam Jones said, well, this is it. <laughs> we fix to be checking out of here in just a little bit. If this is my last, if this is my last sermon, I'm fixing to preach a good one. And he preached like forked lightning, and I'm talking about he gave the invitation, and multitudes of people started coming to the altar and praying, getting saved. About that time, he could tell Thomas Ryman was back there in the very back, and he was just holding on to that seat. The invitation, they were doing just as I am without one plea, and Thomas Ryman stepped out. He walks in. Sam Jones says, this is it. Mr. Ryman took his hand out. said, Sam Jones, I don't know what you got, but whatever you got, I need it. Come down the altar. Old tent revival. Gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. Keith, he sold everything that had to do with gambling, liquor, anything that he had to do with all of that in Nashville, Tennessee. And I forgot what year it was, but in the late eight, maybe 1881, I think is right. I think I'm right on the 1881. He built, Thomas Ryman built an auditorium in Nashville downtown, and today it's called the Ryman Auditorium. Now, we know it as the Grand Ole Opry. And there's nothing wrong with banjo. I love it. I love it. Like it. But next time, next time you go to this place, now they've, re, they've redone a lot of things. This is the old building. Thomas Ryman built this for Sam Jones to come to Nashville and be able to preach anytime he wanted to and not be on them hard wooden seats. <laughs> He built this, I think it was 20, yeah, almost 2,000 seats in that building for Sam Jones to come preach. You know why? Because God said, I'll bring the bread if you'll be the salt. Church, our churches are dying because we've lost our saltiness. We don't make people thirsty anymore. We don't irritate, we're afraid to offend anymore. We're afraid to put the salt on that open wound. We're afraid to make people thirsty for what we have. And one of the reasons we're not seeing America, American revival is because the church has lost its savor and we're not salty anymore. 
I don't know about America, but I can tell you about Millsfield. If everybody in here would get real salty, God says, I'll bring the bread. You bring the salt. I'll stick my hand out of heaven and I will get in a covenant relationship with you and make an agreement that if you'll be the salt, I'll do my part and send revival to Millsfield. What'd you bring to the table this morning? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for these that have gathered. It's a lot of visitors, and we, we're glad for them. A lot of our home folks are here. Some of them are watching by way of Internet, and that's what it's for. That's